Hello, and welcome to a special forum event hosted by the Institute of Politics at Harvard Kennedy School. I'm Doug Elmendorf, the Dean of the Kennedy School, and it's good to have you with us tonight. One of the great joys of being at Harvard is the thought-provoking conversations between remarkable people that occur here. Today, we are fortunate to have three very remarkable people in the forum. Larry Bacow, the president of Harvard University, will be speaking with David Rubenstein, a leader in business and philanthropy. The conversation will be moderated by Wendy Sherman, who is a professor of practice at the Kennedy School and director of our Center for Public Leadership. Today's conversation is about leadership. My own career has let me see so clearly the importance of principled and effective leadership. Before coming to the Kennedy School as Dean, I spent most of my career in Washington, DC, working in economic policy for the US government. I was able to watch up close as good public leaders help to make people's lives better. And unfortunately, as bad public leaders had the opposite effect. We need principled and effective leadership across the board in our governments, in our nonprofits and civil society organizations, and in the private sector. The right leadership across these sectors will improve societies so people can lead better lives. Our guests tonight are exceptional leaders from the realms of higher education, business and philanthropy, and government and international relations. Larry Bacow is the 29th president of Harvard. He served earlier as a faculty member at MIT, as chancellor of MIT, and as president of Tufts University. He has been known for many years as an important leader in the field of education. I think the beginning of Larry's distinguished leadership may have been his earning two degrees from the Kennedy School. I'm very lucky though to be working for Larry and learning from Larry all the time. David Rubenstein co-founded the private equity firm, the Carlyle Group, more than 30 years ago. and is an outstanding leader, not only in business, but in philanthropy. He has pledged to give away the majority of his wealth as part of the giving pledge. He is a member of the Harvard Corporation, the university's governing board, and an important supporter and advisor uh, to me and to the Kennedy School. David is the author of a new book called How to Lead, Wisdom from the World's Greatest CEOs, Founders, and Game Changers. My colleague, Wendy Sherman, had a distinguished career in government and international relations before coming to the Kennedy School. Part of her public service was serving as the Undersecretary of State for Political Affairs and leading the US negotiations with Iran that resulted in the 2015 nuclear agreement. We're all very fortunate tonight to have these three extraordinary leaders with us. Please join me in welcoming Larry Bacow, David Rubenstein, and Wendy Sherman. Doug, thank you very much. And as you said about yourself um, a little bit, and the rest of us know so well, you are a great leader. And along with Larry as university president and David on the board of your overseers have been just phenomenal leaders during a really difficult time. And I'm gonna come to that kind of leadership with our two guests. I hope we have a little bit of fun. David Rubenstein is one of the world's greatest interviewers. So I am just so excited to have a chance to turn the tables on him and interview him. And of course, I work for Doug Elmendorf who works for Larry Backhouse. So we all work for Larry. So it's sort of fun to ask him a few questions as well. And I hope I reflect what everyone in the audience is hoping for. So let me start with the two of you. Neither of you started out to be what you are today in terms of your careers. David, uh, you began as a lawyer. Larry, a professor of environmental studies. In fact, the thesis was um, profoundly called regulating occupational hazards through collective bargaining really quite a compelling thesis title. And in your book, David, How to Lead, you tell us that Eric Schmidt of Google applied to Princeton to be an architect. Condi Rice wanted to be a concert pianist. Colin Powell studied geology. 
Now, we all know that the students come to the Kennedy School with a plan. They know what they want to do and they want to go get it. But you didn't end up doing what you started out to do. What did you learn about becoming a leader in the change that you went through? And I'll start with you, David. Well, um... To be a leader, I think you have to be good at something. And to be good at something, you have to really enjoy it. And I didn't enjoy the things I was doing before, uh, certainly not the practice of law. And the practice of law didn't enjoy me. My clients repeatedly told me I wasn't that good a lawyer, and they were right. And my partners told me the same. So I, I got lucky and founded a firm that took off, and, and I, I enjoyed it. And then I now enjoy what I'm doing in, in, in the nonprofit area. But I tell students all the time, you have to find something that you enjoy. Nobody ever won a Nobel Prize hating what they do. You have to love it. And if you love it, you'll be good at it. And you can be a leader in your field. And so I tell young students all the time, I tell my own children, experiment. I didn't start Carlisle until I was 37 years old. Uh, so I experimented with many things. I worked on Capitol Hill, the White House, practice law, many other things. Uh, you know, I, something, I got lucky. Sometimes people don't get uh, lucky until they're 40 or 50. But when you find what you love and you enjoy it, it'll make life so much more pleasurable and you can be a leader. So Larry, how did you go from that compelling thesis to being a university president? Well, it was clearly, I mean, the answer is obvious. It was my Kennedy School education. Um, <laughs> uh, um, you know, I think for most of us, our, our careers are really a series of fortuitous accidents. You know, I always tell students that a career is only knowable in retrospect. On the day they retire, they can look back and they can say, ah, that was my career. And um, up until then, you know, people are just making plans. And as the saying goes, man plans and God laughs. Um, I think that, you know, you, one, I would agree with everything that David said. Um, and in fact, uh, sometimes figuring out what you don't want to do and what you don't like doing early on is really, really good. Better to figure it out when you're young than, you know, 45 or 50, uh, when you're really invested in, in something. And I think it's important to be prepared to recognize opportunity when it walks up and hits you in the face. I mean, my career wasn't planned. Um, in fact, uh, for 21 of my 24 years on the faculty at MIT, I was just a working faculty member. I studiously avoided um, any opportunities to be a department chair or dean or anything else. I just enjoyed, you know, teaching my courses and, and doing my research. And, you know, in my case, um, sort of the opportunity was sort of almost thrust upon me. So it wasn't something that I went looking for, um, but it's something that wound up happening. And when I had the opportunity to go into administration, I did it in part because it was a chance to fix a lot of things that used to bother me as a faculty member. And I realized that, you know, uh, it was fun. Um, and uh, people told me that I was doing it reasonably well. So, you know, I'll keep at it until I screwed up badly enough that think, mm, maybe you should try something else. Okay, let so me, you both, I mean, both said, that, Wendy, go I'm ahead, David. That there's an image that people like Bill Gates dropped out of Harvard and Mark Zuckerberg dropped out of Harvard and they knew what they wanted to do and they built these great companies. That is very, very, very rare. It is more typical that you bounce around, do many different things, some good, some not so good. And then later in life, maybe in your 30s, maybe in your 40s, you'll really figure out what you love. So that's my point. Okay, so you both talked about figuring out what you love and that you really can become a strong leader if you find your passion. But what are the other attributes that each of you are great leaders in your own field. And David, your book is filled with folks who lead and have mastery in, in very different arenas. So what are the attributes that make for a great leader? In, in your book, you talk about discipline, hard work, integrity, curiosity, humility. Are those the ingredients of a great leader? First is luck. Uh, you have to make your own luck to some extent, but you know you meet meet people, and they might help you get in a certain area of uh, life. So luck is important. Beyond luck, I think it's focus. Focusing on one thing. Don't try to do a thousand things. Try to do one thing very well, and then eventually more power will come to you, and more opportunities will come to you. Learn how to communicate with people. You can't have be a leader if you don't have followers. You have to communicate with the followers. You have to 
write well, talk well, or lead by example by communicating that way, you also have to have a vision of where you want to go. You can't just say, I want to be a leader. I don't know where I'm going, but follow me. You have to have a vision of what you're trying to do. You also have to keep exercising your brain. You can't assume when you graduate from graduate school or college, you learn every, you know everything you need to know. You have to keep reading and reading and reading and exercising your brain so that you have more knowledge and you can keep up with what's going on. And also, as you mentioned, I think humility is important. We all know a few leaders who are maybe not so humble, but the greatest leaders, the ones in the book that I, I have just written, have great humility. They came, they're humble because they realized they were lucky. They realized there are many people more talented than them, but some things went their way and they became a well-known leader. So humility is important. And if you're not humble, try to fake it a little bit, but at least be humble in your demeanor because I think arrogance is not gonna get you very far. And again, last point, ethics. You have to be very honest. When I started practicing law, the head of the firm came into our office into the uh, young lawyers uh, meeting and said, you only have one thing in your life to worry about, your reputation. You carry that the rest of your life. It takes a lifetime to build it, five minutes to destroy it. Don't destroy your reputation by doing something ethically wrong. Very good advice. Larry, what are the attributes that you see? Well, you know, I've spent my entire career in higher education. So I've, and I've spent a fair amount of time now, um, now looking for leaders in higher education, hiring deans, being part of search committees of, of various sorts. And, and so, um, you know, my comments are really focused on what does it take to lead in, in a university setting. Uh, and I, I always look for five things, you know, when I'm trying to recruit leaders or, or try to be helpful in identifying them. Um, the first thing is the quality of mind because in a university, it's the coin of the realm. Um, and people don't get smarter on, on a job. And if they, if they lack the kind of um, intellect necessary to succeed in a place like, like this, they're not gonna succeed at all. Uh, the second, and it speaks to, I think what David has just said is quality of character. When I, I look at leaders who fail in higher education, it's, it's never because they're not smart enough. It's usually because um, they suffer from deficiencies of character. And in my experience, high profile jobs amplified deficiencies of character. If people are insecure, the, the job will make them more insecure. Um, if they have problems with being trusted, it will only magnify and amplify those kinds of problems. So, you know, quality of character, and this is, as David says, it's about honesty, it's about integrity, it's about humility. Um, um, the third thing I look for, uh, again, in an academic setting, are people who have good taste. Um, you know, uh, one of the things which we ask our leaders to do is uh, to look over the intellectual horizon and try and make judgments about how whole fields and disciplines are evolving. And some people are good at that and others aren't. And then having decided where you're going to place your intellectual bets, you need the good taste to know which horse to ride, uh, making judgments about people. Some people are good at hiring people and others aren't. Uh, they just don't know how to determine you know, who is well suited for a particular task. Um, then, you know, I think it, this is going to sound tautological when I say it, but you cannot lead unless you can get people to follow you. And there are some people who just for the life of them can't get other people to follow them. Um, and, you know, this is about, as David says, the, the power of persuasion, the power of your ideas, the ability to, to motivate, to inspire others. Um, the capacity to paint a vision of the future that's better than the present. Because you really can't lead unless you can persuade people that where you're taking them is better than where they are. Um, you know, a proposition which says, follow me and I'm going to lead you into oblivion, <laughs> really is not a good recipe for getting people uh, to follow you. And then I look for people who are team players. It's, you know, as, as leaders, you need to be able to both assemble a team, but also be part of a team. Uh, there is no leader who's not part of a larger team. And, you know, people who are, uh, if it's all about them, if they make leadership about themselves as opposed to about the organization or the institution, long-term, they don't wear well, they will not succeed. So those are the things, at least I've found to be helpful in trying to identify leaders um, and people who one can entrust with at least a good chunk of a university. So 
the three of us are white and two of us are guys. And we're also older. We're not the age of the students that are at the Kennedy School or the other graduate schools or the undergraduates here in Harvard. What do you see that is changing about leadership? Or do you think it will remain the same? Many young people today that I listen to think about leadership in horizontal terms, not vertical terms. Uh, when the Women's March happened, uh, there wasn't an identified leader. There wasn't a Gloria Steinem or a Shirley Chisholm that stood up. There wasn't um, Martin Luther King during the civil rights protests that have taken place, the protests for social justice that are so profound in our time. Um, there seems to be a different sense that leaders have to be proximate, that they have to come from the communities that are experiencing the actual problem, not folks who may have thought about these issues and can try to define how we should move forward. Do you think things have changed? Do you think leadership requirements are different? How do you see things today? David, you interviewed so many extraordinary people who are perceived as leaders. I don't know whether that's the case right now for the generation that may be listening to this conversation. What do you think? Throughout organized history, um, reverence has been given to older people. Uh, societies have re revered people who had wisdom, and they tend to have wisdom when they're in their 50s, 60s, 70s, or 80s. Uh, I think that is not uh, as much the case today. The theory is that older people have wisdom, they have more experience and more knowledge. But be in, the, in the era of knowledge where everybody has access to every piece of information, Younger people don't really think that older people necessarily have more wisdom or more knowledge than they have. And so younger people are more empowered than they were years ago. Now, of course, revolutions always start with younger people starting them. But now, not when you're dealing with revolutions, but just generally changes in society, younger people don't feel that older people necessarily have more wisdom. And because of social media, they can learn from other peers of theirs more than they could before. So I think older people don't have as, as much I'd say authority as they once did. On the other hand, think about this. In a country of 330 million people, the two people who are running for president of the United States are 78 and 74. How did that happen? Uh, it's an aberration. But generally, I would think in the future, you're probably going to have people who are running for president or other major positions who are more in their 40s and 50s, not in their 60s and 70s, as much as I would prefer the people in their 70s get more and more power, because now that I'm in my 70s, I recognize that uh, there is enormous amount of wisdom when you're in your 70s. I couldn't agree with you more on that last point. Larry, how do you see it these days? Well, do you see well, leadership you know, actually, changing? Uh, you know, I'll, I'll just reflect a little bit on the issue of sort of horizontal leadership. I think that as um, there will always be organizations. And as long as there are organizations, there will be people who will need to lead them. And so there will be movements that may lack identifiable leaders but I think that um, we will always need people who are in a position to be able to organize others and who are willing to accept the responsibility that comes with leadership. So uh, I, I guess I would take issue with at least part of the premise of your question. I think that um, certainly there will be times in which we will see no visible leaders um, as different groups come together for certain purposes. But once you get to the point of really trying to organize society to address concrete problems, um, once you look at how one deals with optimizing an organization to perform a function, I don't care what the function is, uh, there, you know, somebody is going to have to be um, take responsibility for helping to organize and allocate the resources and motivate the people and hold them accountable and and to articulate the values of the institution of the organization, uh, that will require leadership. So talk a little bit about failure in leadership. Uh, David, you mentioned you found out you weren't such a great lawyer. In some of the interviews in your book, leaders faced failure along the way. Uh, you and I are both from Baltimore. We remember when Oprah Winfrey, who you interviewed in your book, 
uh, was uh, on television in Baltimore and she literally actually was fired, uh, found her way to Chicago and the rest as we say is history. Um, what did you learn from failure and how did people ultimately get past failure to succeed? How's that possible? Of course, your main point is that good interviewers come from Baltimore, is uh, your point. Absolutely. You and Oprah and me, okay. But uh, <laughs> the truth is, uh, you cannot be a good leader if you haven't failed. I have met some people in life who were Rhodes Scholars, Supreme Court clerks, and every app, uh, award you could possibly name. And then when they got later in life, they had never really failed. And then when they got into a really big challenge, they didn't know how to deal with it. What you need to do is learn how to fail and fail is good because you'll pick yourself up, you'll learn from it. So everybody I interviewed in the book, they like to talk about their failures. Why? Because to some extent it shows humility, but also that's where they really learn things. So if you've never failed in life, you're not likely to be that successful in life, in my view. Uh, there may be a few people that haven't failed, but generally that's where I got most of my uh, wisdom is failing. And I, I got a lot of my humility by failing too, but failing is good. It may not feel that way at the time, but later on, you'll be glad that you failed at something because you learn a lot from it. And I, I would just add to that that, you know, if you're if you've if you've never failed at something, you haven't tried to do something that's really hard and challenging. Uh, you know, I think it's important. I always say to the people who I work with, the challenge in life is to make new mistakes. You know, um, nobody's going to bat a thousand. Uh, in fact, bat three hundred lifetime, you got a good shot at the Hall of Fame. So I think it's important to be able to learn from your mistakes, um, not try to avoid them all, you know, ever making a mistake. Um, and that means that, you know, you're going to fail. So I'm completely with David. Um, the, I think it's important to actually develop the capacity to step back and reflect upon what you're doing and why you're doing it and why sort of your theory of action may in fact be false. Um, and why you need to think differently about something, uh, and why you need to seek other opinions, and why you need to talk to people who think differently from you, because in fact, we learn from our differences. No one individual, no one leader is going to have all the answers to anything. So I think, you know, it's a combination of humility, it's a respect for the fact that you can learn from other people, and the recognition that you need to try things that you may not always succeed at, and to take those failures as learning opportunities um, and to do better. So Larry, what, what part does risk play in all of that? Have you taken risks in your own career journey and did those risks pay off? Did they lead to failure? Did they lead to your greatest success? What's risk have to do with all of this? Well, you know, you, you need to believe in yourself. Um, but, you know, my, my late mother had a wonderful um, saying, uh, my sister and I used to worry about something. My mother would sort of look at us and say, what's the worst that can happen to you? Uh, can you live with that? Then why worry? So I think that's actually a good way of thinking about risk. Um, David, my mother was not in the private equity business, but if she was, I think her, her principle of cover your downside, the upside will take care of itself. And uh, so I think that, you know, there's risk in everything. Uh, when I graduated from the Kennedy School, uh, and I was trying to decide what I was going to do. Adele and I thought we were going to move to Washington, D.C. It was actually the start of the Carter administration. David, I might have encountered you there. Um, and I had an opportunity to uh, for somebody who was you know, uh, on leave from MIT and teach for two years at MIT. It was a two-year non-tenure track terminal appointment. You know, this is as low as it gets on the academic totem pole. Uh, and you know, it seemed like an interesting thing to do for two years. So I said, I'll give it a try. Um, and you know, two years turned into 24 years. Um, was there risk involved? Well, there was certainly no job security with, you know, with, with that job. Um, like David, I actually went to law school and decided early on I wasn't gonna practice. Um, I had no idea what I was gonna do, but I decided that the, you know, having worked for a law firm the summer after my second year of law school, that I was not cut out to practice law. Um, my classmates were worried about what was going to come of me, but I, I figured I'd sort it out. I'd find something to do. Uh, so I think you also need to believe in yourself um, without being too cocky about it. I mean, but you just, when I say believe in yourself, 
believe that if it doesn't work out, you can pick yourself up, dust yourself off and try something else. One of the nice things about this country is that we don't write people off when they have failed um, at something. Uh, in fact, quite the contrary. Uh, we admire people who've tried things and they, they haven't succeeded and they pick themselves up and try and do it again and then they succeed or even after multiple times. So David, when you began Carlisle, it was a huge risk. You were beginning a private equity firm in Washington, DC, really? What was, what was that about? And what did you learn from your interviews about risk takers and leadership? Well, I would, when I started Carlisle, uh, there was no phrase private equity. They were called buyout firms and nobody paid attention to us because Washington was a backwater in terms of finance. So we could make some mistakes and nobody would really uh, know about it, I, I think. And I didn't think it would be a very big firm. I didn't want to take more than four or 5,000 square feet. And I didn't want any uh, chance of ever getting a bigger uh, amount of space. I didn't take any lease extensions or options on that. So I didn't really know what would happen. But I realized I wasn't really enjoying the practice of law. And therefore, I thought I might enjoy uh, private equity investing. And it worked out OK uh, for me. I wish that Larry, though, had joined the Carter administration, because had, had he done so, we might have been reelected. We needed more talent. We didn't have Larry. And I also would agree with Larry that the best wisdom comes from Jewish mothers. And my mother used to give me all the wisdom all the time as well. And I will never forget, though, uh, the only time I think she was thinking I really wasn't telling her the truth was that after the Carter administration ended, all the people told me how great I was while I was in the White House. They didn't want to hire me. And so I couldn't get a job. And I didn't want to tell my mother her unemployed son was, you know, basically not wanted by anybody. So I told her all these law firms in Washington were making me offers. I couldn't decide which one to pick from. And uh, I just had to take me a while. And after about six months of deciding, she said, Baby, David, just take one of them already. Doesn't make which one, I mean, which difference it makes, uh, which one you pick. She didn't really realize, I think, but maybe she did. I didn't really have that many offers, maybe just one. So um, just to turn the tables here a little bit, uh, Senator Kennedy of Louisiana, during the Amy Coney Barrett uh, hearings this week, turn to the candidate for the Supreme Court of the United States and asked her, who does the laundry? Now, I think he asked that question as a kind of admiration that she might be able to do laundry and be a Supreme Court justice at the same time. So I have two questions for you guys. Has anyone ever asked you who does the laundry in your house? And secondly, have people asked you about how you integrate family into the demands of your work life? Well, let me take a stab at that. No, nobody's ever asked me because they can know, they, they, they can assume I'm not that good at that. And I wasn't. When I went to college, I did laundry the first week and my underwear came back pink. I didn't realize that, you know, red towels and, and white <laughs> underwear don't match. So I, that was the last time I actually did laundry. And I'm a good thing for the, the laundry firms that I don't know how to do it. So they, they make money off of me. Um, in terms of um, uh, the, the whole issue of uh, children and, and career, Jackie Kennedy, um, the wife of uh, President Kennedy, said famously that if you mess up raising your children, nothing else in life really matters. And she's right. The hardest thing in the world to do is raising children. And the hardest thing to do if you're a prominent person, if you have a, a career that takes a lot of your time, is raising children. Because it's much harder if you're wealthy, or if you're famous, if you're prominent, or if you're very busy to raise children. So it's an important thing. And, and there's nobody that's probably figured out perfectly how to do it. Uh, I, I think in my book, it's pointed out that Ruth Bader Ginsburg uh, said that her husband was unique in that he was a Harvard Law School graduate, a very famous lawyer, but he thought that child rearing was an equal opportunity uh, effort and that both the mother and father should do it. And she recognized it was unusual at the time. So I would say in my generation, there's no doubt that the men probably have spent more time uh, avoiding some of the difficult tasks of child rearing, and the women have probably done that. It's changing a bit, and I wouldn't say I figured it out perfectly for sure, but uh, you know, I you know, I I always look back on the mistakes I made. I probably could have done more things, but I don't know that my children now say to me, "I wish you'd spent more time with me." They don't seem to be that anxious to spend more time with me now. So I don't think that they really missed that much of my my time, but maybe they did. David, if you're a leader out in the world, and Larry, I'll ask you these same questions in a minute because I know you think about these things in terms of Harvard. When you're a leader out in the world, what responsibility do you think one has as a leader to consider 
the family life of one's employees, of one's followers? What, how does that fit into the thinking of being a leader? I think a good leader is sensitive to the family needs of uh, employees. And any good leader will certainly, uh, if there's a challenge, uh, certainly give the employee the time off, the resource or whatever necessary to help deal with that family problem. Because if you have a family problem, uh, you're not gonna probably be that great an employee. And so just from selfish reasons, you should try to want to have the uh, employee happy and, and, and take care of the family problem. But as a human, you wanna make sure that a parent is able to do for his or her child what they, they should be able to do. So I think it's increasingly important. It wasn't 50 years ago. It wasn't 25 years ago. It is today, and it will be even more so five and 10 and 15 years from now. Larry, what, how do you think about these? I know, I know you do, because I've seen uh, memos come out from your office uh, thinking about Harvard staff and, and how to lead in this environment. Well, you know, I, I think in some ways the notion of work-life balance is a myth. I mean, there's always tension between you know, managing work and family, and especially right now as we're all zooming from home. I mean, here, you know, uh, I, I love the New Yorker cartoon that ran not too long ago. It's the guy who's saying, I can't figure out if I'm working from home or living at work. And um, so I think we're always struggling with that tension and trying to readjust things um, in, in our lives. Um, but, you know, I've, I've often given students advice, um, and that is to put their relationships first. Um, I'm often struck by how many times I've, I've talked to two students who are in a, what I thought was a committed relationship, and I've asked them, so are you guys going to get married? And um, I've been struck by the response that I've sometimes given, well, we're going to wait and see where we both get jobs and then decide. And to which my response was, well, let me see if I, if I get this right. You're basically going to outsource the decision of whether or not you marry each other uh, to two HR departments. Um, you know, what's wrong with this picture? So, you know, I, you know I've tried um, to put my family first. Um, and there are times that I've been more successful at that than others. I've been blessed to be married to uh, somebody who's been extraordinarily understanding um, about that. And I, I would agree with David that, you know, um, ultimately our legacy is far more our, you know, the children that we raise and uh, the values that we impart to them. But I also think as a leader, we lead by example. And, you know, if we're, if we're not willing to demonstrate that we care about our families, um, that we are concerned about others, then it's unlikely that the people around us are gonna also embrace those values. So, you know, it's, you know, I wish I could say, Wendy, it's, it's real easy. All you have to do is A, B, C, and D, and, you know, everything will be fine. Um, but now I have to quote my mother yet again, David, um, and, you know, the wisdom of Jewish mothers, it's endless. My mother, um, <laughs> when Adele and I got married, gave us, um, some wonderful advice. Uh, she said, marriage is not a 50-50 proposition. She said, it's a 90-10 proposition. Sometimes it's 90-10 one way, other times it's 90-10 the other. And now I have to give equal time to Adele's mother who also gave us great advice because she said, and this was really brilliant. She said, you know, my advice to you is treat your spouse as well as you would treat a stranger. Uh, and if you think about that, there's just a huge amount of wisdom in that. Well, I don't want to make this into a Jewish mother thing, but- uh, Really, I can, I can add in here. I the, am a Jewish uh, mother. Jewish, Jewish mother of, of Marty Ginsburg, uh, the mother-in-law of Ruth Bader Ginsburg famously said when they were getting married, I'll give you some marital advice. Sometimes it, it helps to be deaf, which is to say, don't listen to what your spouse says, just ignore it and just pretend you're deaf. And maybe that's a good thing in raising children as well. <laughs> Right. So to a very serious subject, um, ensuring diversity in views, in race, in religion, in gender, LGBT, LBG, LGBTQ, um, ethnicity, geography, understanding that we live in a complex world where people like us are the minority, 
quite frankly. And in the United States, we will be a majority minority country in the very near future. The world already is majority non-white. And religions are quite diverse across the world with different points of view. So as a leader in this time, how do you think about that? And how should we be leading? David, you clearly made an effort in your book to interview, or you've interviewed a wide range of people, but to put a diverse group of interviewees into your book. Was it easy to find that diversity or was it hard? And what do you think the future is gonna look like? Well, first it's not hard if you try. If you look, it's not hard. Some people don't look and they don't try. But the most interesting thing is to me about this subject is this. The human brain to me is the most amazing thing on the face of the earth. It has separated us from all the other species on the face of the earth, what this human brain can accomplish. But for all the abilities of the human brain to do incredible things, it still has a residue of hundreds of thousands of years ago, which says, if you don't look like me, I don't like you as much. And as a result of that, throughout organized history, people that don't look like the majority in any given country or any given neighborhood have been discriminated against. And so when our country started, if you weren't a white Anglo-Saxon Protestant, more or less, you were discriminated against. And that went on for quite some time. It was sought as a value of the country was that it was good to be white. It was good to be uh, Christian. Uh, the world has now changed. And we now recognize that if you are going to compete in the world, if you're going to recognize the value of everybody and take advantage of it in an appropriate way, you have to reflect the diversity of society because the diversity of society will have many different things to contribute. And if you're not prepared to do that, you're gonna be left behind. So the DNA of the United States initially, that our genes were set up so that we valued white Anglo-Saxon Protestants. Now, I think the DNA and the genes of our country are going to recognize that diversity is a strength and we are getting ahead of the rest of the world because we are more diverse than the rest of the world. And we will probably in the end be able to take advantage of this diversity and leave some other countries behind that don't value diversity as much as we are. Larry, your thoughts about this? Well, you know, uh, first, diversity is the pathway to excellence. Um, you will never succeed um, as well if you sample from only a small set or slice of the distribution, as you will if you sample from the entire distribution of talent. So if you think just about gender, you know, excluding half of the population, and you know, you're excluding half of the talent. Um, and so one reason why we embrace diversity is it is a pathway to excellence because you're far more likely to identify the very best people if you look at everybody um, as opposed to only people who look like you. The second reason that we embrace diversity is because as I said earlier, we learn from our differences. If everybody thinks the same way, if everybody has the same point of view, the same perspective, um, we're never going to accomplish nearly as much as if we bring people together who can debate issues, have different points of view, different life experiences, different images of the future, what the future might look like, how it might be better, what it means to be better. And so I think that uh, diversity is, is absolutely key to success going forward in, in a world which, as you've already observed, is going to be, is going to look very, very different than the world in which, you know, those who came before us um, experienced. Uh, and it's a better world as a result. That doesn't necessarily mean that it doesn't at times make for more complicated conversations, more difficult conversations, but I think one of the things which we're trying to do is to learn how we can have those conversations uh, collectively. So um, you've mentioned Ruth Bader Ginsburg. We all have, she's much on our minds because she was quite a revered leader in our country, but she actually believed in incrementalism as a leader. Uh, as you point out in your book, uh, David, she thought her dissents were as important as her majority opinions because they would become valuable years later when we return to the same subjects. Uh, I remember my own youth, late 60s, protesting on the streets and wanting to make change quickly, 
protesting against the Vietnam War. I just watched uh, the Chicago 7, which I would urge everyone to watch. It's really well done, um, where you know leaders believed in making revolutionary change, even at great risk uh, to their life, in fact. Um, do you think in the time we are in with social media, with technological change being so rapid, that incrementalism is possible? Do you think as a leader, we have to take bigger bites out of change given how fast the world is moving or do you think it's just the opposite? Well, the reason that people make change in an incremental way is that historically it's easier to get things done if it's incremental. As Ruth Bader Ginsburg would cite, Thurgood Marshall made incremental changes before he got to Brown versus Board of Education. And she uh, pre uh, preferred to make incremental changes in gender equality because she thought trying to take on gigantic swaths of that issue would make it very difficult to prevail. Uh, today, with so many people able to resist things because so many people have information, so many people have power, it's harder and harder to make revolutionary changes at once because so many people can resist what you're doing. So I think incremental changes are more likely to be uh, the thing of the future as well, because it's gonna be harder and harder to overcome the enormous resistance. Everybody is an expert now, everybody has information, everybody has access to social media, and everybody uh, can resist things. And what humans most like is not change. The truth is most humans, most humans, not all humans, but most humans don't like change. Most people like what they have and what they're doing. And so getting them to change is not that easy. So I think it's gonna be harder and harder to make uh, revolutionary changes. And look at the Congress of the United States in the last 10 years, with the exception of the Affordable Care Act, it's been very hard to get any significant legislation through because everybody's afraid of uh, pissing off somebody and the result is nothing gets done. And I think it's getting worse, not getting better. David, how would you, and turn to you in a minute, Larry, but how do you break through that extraordinary resistance? Well, what it has, you have, from time to time, uh, extraordinary events come along, a 9-11 type situation, for example, where the country is pulled together and brought together. And at that moment, you need an extraordinary leader. Uh, during the Civil War, if Andrew Johnson had been the president, not Abraham Lincoln during the Civil War, we probably wouldn't have uh, come out with the result we did. You need extraordinary people who are prepared to take advantage of the uh, extraordinary situation and then lead with great uh, revolutionary kind of changes as Lincoln did with the Emancipation Proclamation. If you're an incrementalist during a 9-11 situation or Civil War or World War II, you won't get very much done. That's when you have to make big changes, when, they, when the country is more willing to listen to something because they're afraid, they need, they need real leadership then. And that's when you can really make a big change. But David, I would note, and you're a good enough student of history to recall that Lincoln was heavily criticized by many abolitionists for not making change sooner, but Lincoln recognized that he needed to bring people along and to right. create um, a coalition which could survive and to prepare the country for change. Now, uh, Wendy, I always say it's, it's very easy to be an advocate if you never have to take responsibility for a decision. And we've all been in positions where we've had people shouting at us saying, just do this, just do this, never understanding the constraints under which leaders operate, never understanding how it's necessary to build sustainable coalitions uh, to bring about meaningful change. So um, there's a time and a place for advocacy, but also leadership sometimes involves helping people to understand that problems are sometimes more complicated than they may be perceived uh, by those um, who don't have responsibility for dealing with um, a broad swath of, of society or an organization and who only are responsible uh, to those who think like them. And part of what's happened, I think, in the society that we live in today, as David has observed, is technology has permitted many more people to live basically in a very homogeneous echo chamber in which they only interact with people who think like them. Uh, but if you have responsibility uh, for a decision, for an organization, you need to listen to lots of folks and, and you, you can't just tune out everybody else. So I, I do think that there's, you know, uh, incrementalism will always be with us. Um, that's not to say that there won't be times in history in which we will see uh, more dramatic change that, that occurs, but usually because of disequilibrium, which has been often imposed by some exogenous shock to the system. 9-11 was a good example um, of that. 
So I think we're at the point where we have some questions. And the first question is from Justin Seng, who is Harvard College, uh, class of 22. Welcome, Justin. You want to ask your question? You have to unmute and go ahead and ask your question to uh, David and Larry, or better known as President Bacow and Mr. No, Rubin. it's Larry. Go ahead, Justin. By the way, I, I, I like the banner behind you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, <laughs> always important to show some pride. <laughs> Um, so thank you all for speaking with us tonight. Um, um, Ambassador Sherman, Mr. Rubenstein, um, President Bacow. Um, so thank you for joining us to discuss what shapes great leaders. Uh, my name is Justin Sang, and I'm a junior at the college and I serve as the chair of the IOP's Harvard Public Opinion Project, which is known as the team behind the Harvard Youth Poll. Our most recent polls have showed that the uh, Gen Z is finding themselves on the front lines of the triple crisis of COVID. Their uh, education has been disrupted, jobs pros uh, job prospects are faltering, and communities are experiencing a racial reckoning, causing increasing levels in of anxiety and concerns about mental health. With this in mind, how do you think this moment in time will impact the next generation of leaders in both the public sector and the private sector over the next 15 to 20 years? Um, I'm gonna let Larry start uh, with this question. And uh, I also should have noted at the very beginning, hats off to the Institute of Politics, which really leads us in the forum and to Mark Aaron, its uh, leader. Uh, Larry. Justin, it's a great question. Thank you very much. You know, I, I think each generation winds up getting tested in its own way. Um, I was a freshman in college in 1969. Um, in my junior year in high school, 1968, and at least the three of us remember 1968 vividly. You know, that was a time in which um, Martin Luther King was assassinated, uh, followed by Bobby Kennedy was assassinated. Then there was the Democratic Convention, which led to the riots and the Chicago Seven, which Wendy has already alluded to. Um, it, it was an unbelievably turbulent time. Kent State, the invasion of you know, Cambodia um, during my freshman year, a student strike, don't get any ideas, which brought <laughs> all colleges and universities to a halt um, in the spring. So I think you know, each of us gets tested in our own way. And I think um, these are likely to be experiences which you will remember for the rest of your life, and they will influence you for the rest of your life. Um, you know, here I am, um, you know, uh, 50 years after my freshman year in, in college, and I'm still telling the story of, of what it was like being, being a freshman that year. So I, I suspect that you will take much from this experience. The lessons that you take, though, will be those that you yourself um, figure out. Uh, and, you know, the, the, one of the interesting things is that we don't live life in the rearview mirror and we, it just keeps unfolding for us. And so none of us know actually what the next few months are going to be like or the next year or the next several years. But I would tell you that you also have an opportunity to shape those. Um, and, and you'll do that both um, on a micro scale, but longer term, um, ultimately, your generation are gonna have responsibility just as, as we've had to try and, and shape and influence our times. So I'm confident you'll make the most of it. Let me add that uh, there's always a human tendency to say, I'm living in the worst of times. This is a terrible situation, woe is to me. Um, people say that you know throughout lots of times of crises, it takes a long period of time to really realize whether that period of time you lived through, six months or a year or two years was really so terrible that it shaped the rest of your life adversely or, or positively. My advice would be view this as a, a learning experience. Figure out how can you learn now something that you couldn't learn before? How can you learn better technology skills? How can you learn to get along with people better? Whatever you learn during this period of time is probably gonna help you in the future. So don't look at that as a disadvantage, look at it as an advantage. In Larry's generation and my generation, uh, about 62,000 of our colleagues were shipped off to Vietnam and died. And, uh, you know, COVID can kill people, but I don't think it's quite the same as being the military combat. So I won't make light of COVID, but it's a situation where you can deal with it and you can live with it. And I think it should be a learning experience. And, and, and the test of time is 
five or 10 or 15 years from now. Okay, I think our next up is Juliana Green, uh, Harvard Kennedy School MPP, Master in Public Policy, class of 22. Juliana. Hi, thank you so much. P76, Juliana. <laughs> thank you so much for this discussion and so much for the opportunity to ask you a question this evening. So in the past, when I've been asked to lead a team that has considerably more seniority than me, it's been my experience that advocating for changes does not always endear me to other members of staff who would prefer to maintain the status quo and might be particularly uncomfortable being led by someone, by, by a young woman um, who's significantly younger and less experienced than them. So my question is whether you have any advice on how young people can lead older stakeholders in a way that engages them rather than alienates them. I don't think any of us have ever had that experience, Juliana. Uh, David, do you want to try that one? Yeah, look, people who are, you know, 40, 50, 60 years older than you are probably not going to listen to you as much as you might want. Uh, and you might observe from your own parents saying uh, they know what's best from time to time and they might not take your ideas as serious as you would like them. But in the end, persistence with appropriate way of respect, I think, can make a difference. So if you have a good idea, don't yell and scream at people and get mad at them if they don't accept it, but try to persuade them with some um, uh, guile, with some uh, respect, and with some persistence, not arrogance, persistence. And I think in time, people will listen because in the end, people are more open to ideas than I think they were in my generation because with the experience that people have seen over the last couple of years, it's the young people who are starting revolutionary companies, young people coming up with good social ideas of how to improve the society much more than people my age. And so people are much more open to this. I was not as open to it. I'll give you one example before I let Larry a comment. Uh, when my son-in-law to be was at Harvard College, um, uh, introduced to me by my daughter, um, he said his uh, classmate from Phillips Exeter and his classmate at Harvard was going to start a company that helped people kind of date better in Harvard and maybe other colleges. And would I like to invest in this? And I said, look, no college kid is going to have a company good enough for me to want to invest in. And I'm not going to take my Carlisle professionals and waste their time. So I said, no, I don't want to meet Mark Zuckerberg. I don't think that's going to get anywhere. Uh, that was uh, a big mistake. And so people like me are much more open to ideas for young people than I was before. And if you have a good idea like Mark Zuckerberg's, I'll give you my email address. Larry, anything you wanna add? Uh, I'm not sure I can improve upon that. Um, in the end, it is about the power of ideas um, and you wanna work in, in places where the best idea wins. And you have, a, you have a choice of where you spend your time and with whom you associate you know, the kinds of places that you, that you pick to, um, to pursue your passions. And I think you want to be in an organization which values ideas, uh, regardless of where they come from. You know, it's interesting for me having this conversation because um, when I reflect back on it, you know, now I'm an old fogey. We were all young once. And, um, <laughs> you know, I was the, for, for much of my career, I was always the youngest one doing what I was doing. And, and I always looked even younger. Um, and it was always a burden. And I kept saying to myself, you know, maybe one of these days I'll get gray hair. Now I have some, you know, um, it, it helps. Uh, but we do live in an age where it has never been easier uh, to propagate an idea than it is now, uh, because you don't need anybody uh, basically to say this is a good idea. You can go, you know, on social media and before you know it, you can get 10 million, you know, hits uh, just because you've come up with something that other people find interesting. So. Thank you very much, Juliana. I think um, I see next up uh, on the list, uh, Reed Rossman, uh, Harvard College 21 and chair of the Women's Leadership Initiative at the IOP, I'm told. I am, I am. Thank you all for being here today. Um, my name is Reed. I am a senior at the college and also the chair of the Women's Initiative and Leadership here at the IOP. I loved your question earlier about child care, Ambassador Sherman. So I wanted to follow up on that as a young woman entering the workforce, um, sitting with two men who helm arguably some of the, the most important organizations in the world. How each of you thinks through the contingencies of supporting women from a professional standpoint, 
Um, I know just last month we had nearly a million women leave the workforce in the U.S. And so I'm curious how you think through whether that be, you know, childcare or mentoring younger women, how each of you approaches that both, you know, within finance and within education as well. And sort of what are the pathways for women to lead? So, um, Reed, actually, uh, I'm going to quote my wife, so let me give credit where credit is due. Adele has a theory, and I think she might be right, that one of the big beneficiaries of actually all of us being forced to work from home is, is going to be young women and professional women and women of childbearing age. Because now that guys like me have been forced to work from home and to work under these conditions, we understand that people can be enormously productive. So I'm hopeful actually that going forward that there'll be um, even greater opportunities for people who want to make choices uh, that might preference um, you know, child rearing at, at certain points or child bearing, which only women can do still um, uh, than in the past. Um, I think that it is, you know, Again, you are, are living in an age which I think is increasingly making opportunities available to you um, in ways that um, those who've come before you have had to fight for a lot more. That doesn't mean that there's still inequality. There is. And I think it imposes obligations and responsibilities on people like me to try and figure out how can we have child, you know, family friendly um, policies um, in the workforce. How can we provide childcare opportunities uh, for people? How can we ensure that people can move in and out of the workforce at times and not be punished for it? Um, you know, and I think we're getting better at that. That doesn't mean that there's not still lots and lots of work to be done, um, but I, I think we're making progress. So David, if I can just push, push on this a little bit more out of sort of the childcare side of it to you interviewed several women who we became great leaders. They're, they had to be pretty tough uh, in the environment in which they became leaders. Do you think it's still as tough? And if not, what's made it easier or what could make it easier? In the Fortune 500 companies, there are less than a dozen women who are running Fortune 500 companies. Um, so we have made modest progress because 20 years ago there were zero. Um, many of the women who are at the top have uh, had to make uh, adjustments to their child rearing situation. In some cases, uh, for example, I interviewed the CEO of Lockheed Martin, our, her husband said, look, you're more productive than I am financially, I'll stay at home and raise the kids. And so you see a number of those situations where you've got a powerful woman CEO with children, and in some cases, uh, the husband stays at home. In some cases, some of the leading women CEOs have no children, and that's a choice that they presumably made. Um, I think going forward, it's going to be uh, more common for men to be more involved than they have been and more uh, sensitive to the challenges that women have because increasingly more and more women want to be in the workforce and they are uh, the ones that are probably more focused on child rearing than some of the husbands. It's changing, but it's not where it probably should be. I would say the best examples of changes are coming from Europe. For example, uh, in our country, we, we came up with a novel idea, not we came up with, we have a novel idea years ago of maternity leave. That didn't exist before. Women, if they wanted to take time off or have their children, they didn't have paid maternity leave. Later, we came up with the idea of paternity leave, where the husband would take time off. Uh, a Scandinavian country, I think it was Sweden, just came up with a concept in one company, at least, where you get eight months. You can decide who takes it, the husband or the, or the wife. And it's up to you. In some cases, the husband will take it. Sometimes the wife will take it. But I think we can evolve these things. And you know, I wish I could tell you life is going to be pleasant and easy, and you're going to get a husband if you want a husband who's going to do all the things you want. But uh, you know, hope you know, hope springs eternal. But it, you know, it may not work out perfectly. I think we'll also have situations of two wives and two husbands, uh, yeah. and we'll have to work right. it out. All yeah. kinds yeah. of possibilities, Larry. Wendy, sure, quickly, and then um, I'm going to squeeze in one more question. Go okay. ahead. Uh, Reed, when our first child was born, Adele and I both decided to work four days a week, and we each stayed home one day a week, and we, you know, got child care for the other three days a week. Um, you know, it required sacrifices on both of our sides, but 
you know, it worked out um, and we made it work well. And, and actually I'm grateful for having had the opportunity. It was also the case that once we had kids, um, Adele decided that she was gonna work part-time and she was gonna only work in jobs which gave her that opportunity. Now those jobs were never advertised as four day a week jobs, um, but she made a point of negotiating in each case that that's what she would work. And she wound up having uh, positions of enormous responsibility because she was willing to say, here's what I'm willing to do and here's how I'm willing to make it, uh, make it work. So sometimes you have to get the system to bend to what you wanna do uh, in order to, to lead the life that you wanna lead. Um, don't just take things as they are, fight for what you want. And did your children tell you they thank you for that later on in life? <laughs> uh, well, you know, um, we, are, we are blessed with wonderful relations with our kids, uh, relationships with our kids. So for us, at least it worked out well. But um, sorry, I have to quote my mother yet again. She said, it takes a lot of luck to be a parent. It's not enough to be a good parent. And we, we got lucky on with our kids as well. So I think um, I'm going to squeeze in, even though we're going to just go slightly over. Uh, but I see up um, Kazia, I think, Clark uh, from the college. Kazia, are you still there? I, I see you on the, you have to put your, get off of mute and put your video on. Kazia, are you having problems? Can someone maybe get Kazia's question for me and I'll read I'll read it. Okay. Uh, let me see. I, I think I've got uh, that. Um, this will be a good way for us to end. Um, uh, Kazi is asking, as a leader, what is your approach to creating or adapting to an environment that promotes successful teams? One of, I'm sure, the favorite interviews you ever did, David Rubenstein, since you are a Duke University undergrad, uh, is um, with Coach K, who talked about teams, and I actually brought Tommy Amaker our great basketball coach who studied as an assistant coach under Coach K uh, to talk to my class uh, last year about teams. So how do you build a team? What promotes successful teams? Uh, you both have talked about how you have to have followers, but then you are a follower yourself to a larger team. So what did Coach K tell you and what can you tell Kazi and our other students? Coach K um, believes in teamwork. Basketball is a game where you have five players on the court. And even if you have Will Chamberlain or Bill Russell or, or, or Magic Johnson, you still need four other good players and you need teamwork. And that's what he tries to instill in these young, young men. He takes boys, men who are 16, 17, 18 years old and molds them into young men. And it takes teamwork uh, to do that. And I, I would, uh, in another area, I, just, I don't usually quote it, but Ronald Reagan famously said, there's no limit to what humans can accomplish if you're willing to share the credit. So the key in building a team is sharing the credit. Don't use the word I, I, I. Use the word we, we, we. Thank other people. Remember, the, the cheapest words to use in the English language are thank you. It's easy to say it. People should do it and say, thank you for helping me. Thank you for doing this with me. You're great. You did a great job. Praise other people. It'll come back and help you and it'll make the team much better. All right. I don't think I can do uh, any better than that. Uh, um, you know, Maya Angelou famously famously said, um, "In the end, people won't remember what you what you said, but they will remember how you made them feel." And the way in which you get people to work together as a team is to make them feel valued um, and accepted, and as David said, to make them feel good about their contribution that they're making to the larger whole. And um, now, it's one of the many ways that you put together a good team. It also helped. I mean, one of the reasons why Coach K is as good a basketball coach as he is, I have a friend who was Jack Parker, who was one of the, um, he was to college hockey what Coach K is to college basketball. 
And Jack always says, really easy to identify the very best coach in any sport. And I said, who's that, Jack? And he said, it's easy. It's the, it, it usually is the one who gets off the bus with, with the best players. So teamwork is important, but it's also important to have talent on your team as well. Um, Wendy, can I just add as a final comment? Sure. The, race, the reason people watching today should want to be a leader is that I think life can be more enjoyable for you if you're a leader. People who are followers can be happy too and so forth, but I think you can enjoy uh, life more if you're a leader. If you're at Harvard, you must have been a leader to get here uh, to some extent. So I think you would enjoy um, it as a, as a way of improving your feeling about yourself. But secondly, you might improve the world a little bit by your leadership. And that's what you really should wanna do with your life. But along the way, before you try to lead, First, become a good follower. Learn what it means to be a follower. Learn, study the leaders that are leading you. Figure out what you want to take from them, what will work for you, and then, and then try and lead. Because if you don't know what it means to follow, if you can't get people behind you, you'll never succeed. Well, I'm really, really delighted to have been part of this team this evening uh, with great wisdom. Uh, from two extraordinary leaders in very different fields, uh, including, of course, also uh, Doug Elmendorf, um, the Dean of the Kennedy School. And I think that all of us uh, need to reflect on everything that was said here tonight, follow our own compass. And I think we sort of ended where we started, which is find something that's your passion, find something that you enjoy, learn how to work and play well with others, going back to what our moms taught us and our dads. Um, it was great to be with you tonight, David and Larry. Thank you so much for being part of this conversation. If you all want a great read, How to Lead is a good one. That's not a great one. Uh, terrific interviews and my honor tonight to interview both Larry Backow, president of Harvard University, and David Rubenstein, the co-founder of Carlisle, and one of the great philanthropists in our country. Thank you all from the Center for Public Leadership, Harvard Kennedy School. Good night. Thank you, Eddie. Great to be with you. Thanks, David.